Has NXT cancelled a major storyline? Hello, you're watching the Wrestle Talk podcast. I'm Il Faker Laurie Blake. I'm joined by Adam Blompier. Hello. A rare NXT appearance. And we're going to be talking about the idea that uh, NXT seemingly has moved on from the idea of Finn Balor facing Walter at any point in the future, obviously because of the current circumstances. But they've just moved those two participants and all of the Imperium stuff away from each other. We'll also be talking about some other things that happened on the show, namely that they stole Quizzlemania from you, Adam. How do you right. think about that? I right. Know. I'm livid. <laughs> livid. <laughs> uh, so we'll, be, we'll be going through that in a bit, but let's let's get, hop into this first story because this was uh, sort of the reintroduction of Finn Balor after last week, him being attacked backstage. He was in a... They put him in a confrontation with Velveteen Dream the week before to book mm-hmm. a match for ne- for last week. Then last week, it turns out that Finn Balor has been attacked. So he can't go face-to-face with Dream. Dream then comes out for a match anyway, gets attacked by Undisputed Era, which Dexter Loomis jumps into and becomes his yeah. tag partner he for just, no he reason. He teleported to the ring. And just so there, there, was a, there was a lot of stuff happening last week that just made little to no sense. And then this week, it turns out that they say that Finn Balor is going to come on the show next week to confront his attacker. Um, while this is all going on, you, you would assume that the sort of Walter uh, feud is bubbling away in the back backdrop. Obviously, Walter's stuck over here uh, in on this side of the world and can't go over there to continue the feud, uh, which was building on both NXT and NXT UK. Um, don't, I think maybe for Takeover Dublin, I feel like Takeover Dublin was the place to do that match. But I that was know. that. Oh, oh, Walter versus uh, Finn Balor. Yeah, that was yeah. going to be Takeover Dublin. Yeah, so that's that's obviously off the cards now. So it seems like they've just completely scrapped that idea and they've moved all the participants on uh, because the other members of Imperium, Marcel Bartel and Fabian Eichner, who were in the placeholder spot, sort of keeping that feud alive by continually harassing Balor, have now come out and attacked Timothy Thatcher and Matt Riddle, essentially staking their claim for the NXT tag team titles. That's so do right. you think... Do you think this is something they will just forget about now? Or do you think this is a, they're just trying to move us on and then they will bring Walter and Balor back together when they get to do TakeOver Dublin down the line? Well, this definitely kind of like, it, it, it massively feels like they were like, oh, okay, cool. So the world will be back to normal by uh, June, right? Yeah, probably June. And then they're looking like, okay, we might need to rethink SummerSlam at this point. So let's just take everyone that we've got in Florida and have them, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start working out stuff for them, and then NXT UK will just we'll forget about you for a little bit. Uh, you can work on your own stuff. You will work on our own stuff, and then ev- probably like when the world comes back to normal, I do think Finn Balor is probably going to be the next NXT UK champion. I just don't think uh, that match is going to happen. Oh, it, it, like if it's going to happen this year, it's going to be late this year. So yeah, like I understand. There's no point in just like Finn cutting promos on Walter with his passport being like soon he's going to airports and being denied (laughs) (laughs) but oh one of these days uh so yeah it makes sense I think Imperium are a really good test for uh the interim bros awaits Mm -hmm. um it, it yeah it's very weird like it's borderline WCW at points like uh just because of how there's almost zero connective tissue with all of this stuff, but they're doing their best. And I generally think like, it feels like NXT is handling it better than Raw, uh, mm-hmm. handling it better than SmackDown. There's just, uh, maybe that's just because there's a level of trust that's been built up with NXT. But yeah, it seems like Finn Balor has uh, different things on his plate, which is going to be most likely, yeah, Karrion Cross. Yeah, so that's what that's what that's kind of what I was uh, reading into the attack last week that, you know, who, who have we got running around backstage attacking people in locker rooms and in whatever weird areas that Champa decides he's going to film all those promos from, the tech <laughs> area for some reason. Um, Karrion Cross seems like the likely story because uh, there was another promo posted this week on WWE, uh, WWE's YouTube channel from Scarlett Bordeaux with a clear voice this time saying, like, I gave you fair warning. Um, next week, time runs out. So it seems like the Karrion Cross debut whether that's a a squash match or him actually making a his presence felt live on the show um is is on the cards for next week and and i feel like finn balor's a good target for that first feud one thing i do wonder though is because we are now i feel like the the walter finn balor um combination while obviously we had uh, that quick insert of Ilya drugunov 
before we did Bala uh, Gargano. So there were all, there was those multiple feuds going on at the same time. We had quick insert of Ilya Drigunov, and then Bala beats Gargano, moves on to Walter. Bala feels like he's at the top of his game there, ready to challenge Walter. And now we're bringing in potentially Karrion Cross to have a little mini feud. Do you think that by the time we get round to Bala Walter, Bala's star will have diminished somewhat and people won't be as bothered by it? I don't know. It's a really know. tricky situation, right? To get like it's it's quite tricky to get through Karrion Cross now. It like we have to navigate the character they're bringing in seemingly at a really high level immediately because he's already taken out Champa, he's written Champa off TV essentially. Um there was always the rumors that Triple H was going to fast track Killer Cross when he turned up in NXT and whether that was he was only going to be there for a very short time and go to the main roster or he was immediately going to come in at a main event slot. And it seems like he's coming in at the top level of the card. So you're building this guy as this doomsday for the for the the cast of NXT. He has to go over Bala here, or he has to at least harass him or injure him, maybe. So my pitch, I guess, would be if you want to keep Bala hot for Walter, which is a title of your sex tape. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to have Bala and Bala and Karrion Cross build up to something like maybe have like obviously Bala gets attacked and taken out next week so Bala gets destroyed there but in the actual match depending on when they book that match for whether it's in two weeks time three weeks time four weeks time the only way I think to kind of keep everyone looking strong in that WWE way that you know everyone looks strong if no one loses sort of paradox uh, would be to have Champa return I guess and kind of have that match end in a no contest and then you set up Champa versus Karrion Cross and Karrion Cross can beat Champa that's fine uh because Champa's not in the NXT title picture right now and uh he's a really good like he's again at the top of his game but you know obviously he just got beaten by Gargano so he seems like he'd be a really good stepping stone if they want to get Karrion Cross right into main event contention and that way you can sort of preserve Finn it, mm -hmm. like no one's got a timeline on when the world's getting back to normal so I, I feel like if they had big plans for finn probably best to yeah keep that plate spinning just a little bit uh because i think yeah in much the same way that charlotte makes nxt feel bigger with her presence i think finn balor and nxt uk uh same thing there. well yeah and absolutely because of the bt sport deal over here i think that's the big you know that's the big reason for i think like probably behind Drew winning as well. I think they probably thought that was, that's a really good, uh, he's the, he's our gender. Um, so, and then we've got, uh, Bala going over and potentially becoming NXT UK champion. I feel like that's, that's, you know, that, that gives that brand some weight behind it from the main roster of WWE. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess like you, you, don't, you don't know though because it depends on how they feel about NXT UK internally. And obviously, Walter was the first one out of the Survivor Series match, uh, despite. <laughs> so you know that's that is really what they think of the NXT UK champion. So um, it could all still be up in the air. Well, I think it's one of those things where like yeah, we like Walter, like we like Rhea, but obviously they like Charlotte uh, and they like Finn, uh, but. Finn is definitely he has like he hasn't pissed off the fans in the same way that Charlotte has. Uh, Charlotte, by the way, I think is doing great. I thought her match with Mia Yim was good. I, I think Charlotte picked the perfect time to go to NXT as well, right? Yes, like, she's gone to NXT at the time that it becomes the exact same show as Raw and SmackDown. <laughs> <laughs> like there is no difference. Like she could be on Raw and SmackDown and having the exact sort of same level of ovation. Um, she's lost nothing. No, and she is uh, obviously there was a confrontation between her and Io Shirai this week. So uh, next week's main event is going to be Charlotte versus Shirai. Uh, I think that's going to be great. Obviously, mm -hmm. would prefer to have it in front of a takeover crowd. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, obviously, it looks like Charlotte's going to win this because uh, there's not been a crazy amount of build. Is she it? Should have just got a side place as well. Yeah, exactly. Her kind of penile looking chess pieces yeah exactly uh, Olympic dongs <laughs> uh yeah she's I I, I, but, but i do think i thought like um i think the charlotte stuff in nxt is great and i do i do actually think it does it, it does what it says on the tin it does what she's saying she's she was there to elevate mia yim and she got a great match with mia yim under her belt and i thought they both looked really good in this i thought mia yim's uh gutsy comeback was really great i thought she looked awesome when she just started leathering charlotte she hit this big cannonball in the corner she hit the uh, tornado ddt through the ropes 
I thought that match was really, really good. And Charlotte won it, um, I think, like, you know, quite a lucky escape from Protect Your Neck into the figure eight. So I think that just puts mm. over me. And if they can just have Charlotte basically over the period of a couple of months now, just have a match with every member of the NXT uh, women's roster, you elevate all the people that you want to, to the level of like, well, you've all hung with Charlotte now. Yeah, I think it depends. Like a lot of fans have a very different way of looking at uh, what you can get out of a loss. Uh, so there's a lot of people, obviously, who don't like the idea of Charlotte beating uh, a lot of people in NXT. But we have to remember that in NXT, losses don't mean quite as much. In NXT, losses don't mean that you're destined for the scrap heap, which I think people have grown accustomed to on the main roster. Yeah. Uh, instead, like, yeah, like you say, I think uh, with NXT especially, uh, they understand the ethos of put two amazing superstars together, have them have a match, the quality of which means that even in a loss, uh, the loser comes out looking better than they did before the match started. And I think, yeah, Charlotte's going to have that effect. Because I, I think Mia Yim does feel like a bigger talent after having uh, a match of that length and quality. Yeah, and, 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 and also the cyclical nature of the story I thought was really nice. I think what NXT does very well that the main roster doesn't necessarily do is listen to the crowd in the room. And when the crowd are cheering for someone, even when they lose, they normally take that as a sign that they're over rather than just go, well, you didn't get over. And it's like, well, well, you made me lose on TV. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember like a cruiserweight championship, right? The perfect example, uh, Cedric loses in the semifinal, please sign Cedric. Mm -hmm. And Triple H comes out, gives a thumbs up to the crowd, says, yeah, all right then. Yeah. Exactly. Like they understand that kind of big match feel. Um, someone who didn't... <laughs> who didn't fare quite as well i really thought that casey catanzaro like maybe obviously there's still time but yeah she got uh, a little bit brutalized by yeah. um candace who is showing off her poison pixie gimmick now um with the wicked stepsister finisher which i think is great it's, sort of, oh, it's, it's a good very thing. it's very daniel bryany like yeah. heel daniel bryan see i loved i so i didn't i wasn't massively keen on the package last week with johnny and candace the sort of um I feel like maybe it didn't necessarily play up the two the two sides enough of like the sort of uh, the Stepford wivesness of the situation of like it's all sort of a charade of uh, marital bliss and mm. there's this dark undercutting anger from both of them. Um, I, I feel like that maybe they they sort of always felt angry and never did that switch. They tried to graphically show you the switch between the two sort of modes of the. Uh, promo but they never quite i don't think nailed it this week i thought was much better like the sort of uh the couple pairing i love johnny doing the uh intro for candace i thought he had some really good lines it's like currently time. residing in my heart my, heart, my favorite wrestler <laughs> candace the ray i think this i think it's really good use of johnny as well i think it um uh, you know i think people have always wanted to see them sort of be paired up on screen as a couple uh and for most of the run that they've had so far candace has been playing the wife to Johnny Gargano, or she'd been playing the best friend to somebody else on the women's roster. So it's nice to see Gargano sort of reciprocating that and now just being the husband character. Mm. Obviously, next week he's going to have Candice in his corner, likely against uh, Dominic Dijakovic, who called him oh, out later in that. That sounds. Which... Oh, oh, just give it give it its time i'm yeah, there for exactly. it i'm sure they will but i yeah i just think i i think this uh dynamic between the two of them is really great i i really liked the uh poison pixie thing from candace ray i thought her new uh entrance music is a banger i think i think i think the whole revamp has been great and it's she was the probably the character that needed it the most on the nxt roster i think because I just didn't feel like there was any way for her to get out of being best friend Candice the Ray, uh, perennial loser Candice Ray, Candice the Ray, <laughs> without really getting this big turn. And I, NXT's pulled some great heel turns recently that have completely revamped people and refreshed them. Like Io Shirai being having her match with Charlotte next week is all off the back of that heel turn. So mm. um, I'm very excited for that. Uh, one thing I not into massively, and I don't know how you feel, obviously, apart from the obvious theft of Quizzlemania was uh, the Riddle and Thatcher pairing. Um, oh, hang on. I do have a, uh, I do have a picture of the uh, newly bros set. Hang on a second. Mm. Bastards. <laughs> 
<laughs> bastards. <laughs> I I like I think I think the um I, I've said this before, I think the pairing of Riddle and Thatcher is great if they're gonna split them apart um and have them feud for a bit. Uh I think it doesn't work as well as the obvious Broserweights pairing, I think, because Pete Dunne has that sort of He's got his surliness is a uh, it's like a teenage put on surliness. It's a fake surliness. It's that sort mm. of you. I don't buy for a second that Pete Dunne's actually that cross all the time. Uh, also, because, you know, I'm from the UK and I know just that's just how people are from his part mm. of the world. Um, so he's like, he's like Stan's sister from South Park. You know that there's love in there deeply, but there's just. There's, the there's, a, there's that there's that twinkle in the eye of I'm not letting on I, I'm just refusing to smile because that's why I'm wearing a, that's why I'm wearing the mouth guard all the time because if I bite it then it stops me from smiling um I with Thatcher I don't feel that the same that same feeling is behind it that sort of I'm going along with it I feel like his character they're trying to portray as more series pulled into this wacky world but I just feel like he should be more over it than he seems he's sort of just quite happily going along with a lot of it Mm. Um, he, yeah, and... he seems like he doesn't like Matt Riddle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I buy that. I buy that he doesn't like Matt Riddle. Well, then why would you be? Why would you happily be sitting there when Byron Saxton comes out looking like uh, Jim Davidson <laughs> and starts doing this wacky game show with you? I just, yeah, I, I, I liked Byron here. Uh, I thought yeah. the rest of it was actually a bit, just a bit too weird for me. It was, it was, yeah, they, they left a couple too many awkward pauses, like threesome on a washer is a mm. bit like there's something, I think there's a slight level, there's a slight disconnect between Matt, Matt Riddle and like, he's, he's pretty much got comedy mostly there, but yeah. there's just a slight disconnect, especially with no fans. I think that is like the difficult thing to make, to make a comedy segment work mm. with no audience that's hard that's really difficult and i like i i think i like the ambition of it and i like the fact that they're not just oh timothy's here and we're not going to bother to do more work with it they're addressing the fact that this is really weird and i would be really interested in the complicated situation where if timothy thatcher gets pinned do they actually lose the championships i guess they do but then what does mm. pete do about that uh i think that's interesting i don't like again it's a bit wcw yeah. um and i don't know if necessarily that level of complication is fun but it feels like that may be where they're going with this is there a tidy way out of this we don't know because yeah i guess that's the thing is like they're going to get thatcher pinned and the, the belts are gone when pete turns up again are they going to do pete comes back but thatcher says well look i've spent all this time defending the belt so i'm a tag team champion and you're not now and that starts off some sort of uh, tug of war for the heart of Riddle, who won't notice it's going on. Uh, yeah, I just, I just find the the ham fisted comedy in these sections just a bit like the idea is there, and the sort of threesome on a washer, uh, don't need a TV to Netflix and chill stuff. It, there's, there is that, there is an edge. Yeah, to it, but it, it was that sort of they were trying to play up that Riddle's a bit stoned slash stupid. And is accidentally getting the right answers, um, and they just—I don't think they went far enough with it. It wasn't. It was just it, there wasn't that logical thread of like I'm going to write this thing, which is like yeah, saying to um, Timothy Thatcher, "Would you ever buy a TV?" Well, if the price was right, yeah. <laughs> I don't think people who don't people who don't own TVs, I think they don't not own them because they're expensive. You can get a TV for fairly cheap. It's mm. just uh, it was a bit. It was a bit tortured. Uh, and obviously, uh, a complete theft of everything we're doing uh, Wednesdays uh, on Parts Fun Known. Lovely, <laughs> lovely Quizlemania. Uh, tune in um, every Wednesday to see that beautiful show. Um, speaking of things that I can... Well, this is not... I would say this is not WCW. NXT is in a weird place. I think, I think generally NXT has got the formula for no fan shows better than anything else in the WWE family. Um, but there is one thing, uh, and we'll get to that, I think, when we talk about the main event. The main event was great. Uh, but uh, there's one thing that felt, not yet, yeah, not WCW, but more Lucha Underground. Uh, and you can't get more Lucha Underground than uh, 
King Cuerno. Uh, <laughs> King Cuerno, yeah, getting attacked by uh, satanic dudes, uh, like satanic cult dudes in suits. It, it like it feels like did King Cuerno just come to <laughs> to WWE being like, I've got these ideas. Uh, I, 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 you know, oh where? Interesting. Where did you get these ideas from? Oh nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Yeah. Season one of it was on El Rey. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I I preferred the match this week with Swerve to the match last. I don't think the match last week really got me excited for Phantasma, um, especially as his debut match. I thought it was a bit slow. I don't think him and Gallagher uh, necessarily gelled mm. in the way that I would want to see. I think him and Swerve had a lot more chemistry. There was really cool moments like the big Fosbury flop to the outside with an absolute missile of a suicide dive. Yeah, I mean, uh, I want to see. I, I Arrow know, from the depths of hell. They don't yeah. call it that for nothing. Yeah, I know. I know it's an impossibility to do this, but I would love to see that one and Akira Tozawa's one collide. Ooh, I don't Jesus know how you make Christ. that happen, but I want to see what happens when that happens because I think wanna... it might form a black hole. <laughs> or both men just immediately die. <laughs> they just <laughs> yeah, fall straight just, down. Great. Um, but yeah, my God, that is an amazing suicide dive. And that, yeah, I think this match made him look a lot better, but I don't necessarily get the, you've got this big debuting guy who you've given a quite a big promo package to as well before the tournament kicks off and you have him lose his second match, which is obviously the nature of a round robin tournament. But Yeah, because uh, I think most people have had, like, well, Tony Nese has had two losses now. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a couple of people who've had one and one, obviously Isaiah Swerve Scott now, uh, and another, another man we'll get to. Um, but yeah, I, well, I, I didn't mind it as much because I actually thought this attack after the fight, like I, th- he's the leader, right? That's, that's what everyone, is the every, leader. That is what everyone's saying. Everyone is saying that this is, this is all, a, this is a swerve for Swerve Scott and uh Phantasma is going to be working with these guys and this is all part of the i'm playing up being a baby face too much here mm. um and then it's going to turn out next week when he desperately needs the win that he's gonna you know he's he's gonna have the guys interfere and that's when he's gonna pick up the victory which i i think is good i i i just um yeah i i want to see more out of it i don't know like i feel like this is kind of we're, we're doing the bare minimum of storytelling for this moment that they're seemingly building to it seemed like I it's it's on brand at least, but you need to know a bit more about Lucha Underground really to kind of because like he's like the thing about um King Cuerno obviously in Lucha Underground was he was a hunter or yeah. and like there's an element of like someone being a collector here like they are snaffling these people off the streets, probably brainwashing them and collecting maybe them into this uh, army, which like yeah for King Cuerno it's very which like that that makes sense. But it's infringement for something I used to do. So <laughs> we have been heavily inspirational to NXT this week. Uh, what can we say? Like it's uh, the sincerest form of flattery. Mm. Uh, but while we're talking about uh, the uh, the round robin, I, I think uh, obviously le- you led with it last week. I don't think you can avoid uh, this storyline, which is hanging mm. a little bit like uh, a death cloud over NXT. I don't know, man. Like I'm, I'm, I. You can only be happy for Drake Maverick if this turns out to all be a work and he's still got his job and he gets yeah. the Cruiserweight Championship. Like, yeah, absolutely. It's it's still a bit yucky. It's a yeah. bit, it sends a message of, well, I guess Drake Maverick just wanted his job more than everyone else. Which well, exactly. Is... I, I think there's just no good way out of it. We said last yeah. week, there's just, there's just having, using it for storyline fuel just means that either... People are either going to read it as a work from the beginning, in which case, gross. They're going to uh, read that because Drake cried on Twitter and that gave and everyone went up in arms about it that he got his he got his job back. But then, what about everyone else um, who wanted their jobs back? Because I'm sure plenty of them did. Uh, or they get him all the way to the final, or next week they get him his second loss and out of the tournament he goes. And so we've just used a man's real trauma to fuel more real trauma um which yeah it's it's it's, i just don't think it's worth it to even touch this as a Mm. storyline that you just don't get anything out of it um even even if it does you know pan out that even if it does pan out in wonderful fashion that drake has proved himself here and he gets his job back i still think enough people are going to be like well i'm actually quite annoyed that you've played with my emotions in this way even if they didn't um, it's just not worth it. 
Yeah, it's really difficult. Um, all, all I guess we can hope for is uh, good, you know, good opportunities for everyone who got released, and uh, you know that Drake Maverick uh, mm. emerges at least from this better than he was before. Yeah, and I get, and that's the thing is, if this was, if this was, say, if we took this storyline uh, outside of the current, if you took, if you took just as kayfabe, is this was just a storyline about Drake Maverick having to do this for his job? Um, and it wasn't based on any real world drama and there wasn't a, a raft of other releases. This match was really good for that storyline. Like Tony Nice played the heel perfectly here. He said, are you going to, you know, he was playing up that, are you going to cry? Are you going to do this, that, the other? Drake was playing the baby face in peril and he was like really good at it. Um, his comeback moment I thought was really fun. Uh, worked really well. The big sort of the punching beat down in the corner that he hits Nice with the, the drop kick and then the drop kick off the top and then the uh, sliced bread cutter thing and then the big bulldog. Like I thought it it, it all looked really, really good. And, and Drake clearly works really well in that baby face role. But um, yeah, it's just all tinged with this yucky brush. Um, yeah. And so there's no way around it. It's a real shame. So yeah, it's just a, it feels like a shame that they waited until now to really lean into what Drake Maverick is amazing at, which is being this incredibly gutsy, very talented uh, underdog. And it's a shame they had him go through the whole peeing his pants thing, you know, mm. getting cucked by our truth, um, having his wedding ruined. Like they went through all of that kind of comedy shtick before they finally came round to the heart of what always made rock star Spud great yeah he's an amazing comedian but he's also damn fire in the ring and a re and like fits that underdog mold perfectly yeah ah, well. it's, yeah it's it is a shame but um so i don't know if his match next match is next week or not um i don't it might know. be a, a week between but yeah because yeah it's just everything comes tinged with this i don't know like he had like someone like jake atlas turning around to him and being like i see that fire in you man it's like who are you jake atlas it's not like <laughs> you know, we don't if care stone about cold you was saying that to him then i'd be like yeah man like if you get a pep talk off stone cold i get a pep talk off jake atlas who's had a one loss on raw and this is his first match in nxt yeah it's it's just a very weird world um speaking of weird worlds we had dexter loomis versus shane thorne on this show as well and i have no idea what their plans are for dexter loomis i just do not understand. I think he's great. I think he's got a really good look. I really like the sort of first time I saw it, the creepy gimmick didn't quite click with me. I think it's really getting there now. Um, the finisher with the Uranagi uh, triangle choke and then the sort of uh, serial killer, I didn't mean to kill him, sort of stroke. <laughs> the Kafa Katami. Yeah. yeah, it's I, I, I really like it. Um, I just wonder where they're going to go with it because he's not said anything about what his plans are. He's clearly been stalking either Dream or the Undisputed Era. I think it's the Undisputed Era. Um, and maybe that'll build to a, a feud or something with Roddy Strong mm. is, is, is what I kind of think. Um, but yeah, like he's a very intriguing aspect of NXT and one they're clearly very keen on because he's been on the last three episodes on the trot yeah like he's i mean that's the thing is like I, I guess in this situation you go with who you who you can reliably promote every week and evidently dexter loomis you know lives close but he and ha he wears gloves to the ring he does wear gloves to the ring right. and what you probably not know is fresh pair of gloves every week <laughs> i i i i kind of dig it I, I i know obviously like i i wish it was a little bit less on the nose with dexter loomis mm -hmm. and you know this the, the absolute shameless ripoff of stranger things uh for his intro uh but he he carries himself with a very unique physical charisma i think like he's in order to put that character forward like the undertaker right undertaker's a stupid gimmick but undertaker had that physical poise that kind of presence to pull it off and even though yet yeah, it doesn't seem like a comparable gimmick right now dex loomis is very good at doing it at least which is the mark of a really good uh especially for a, a good wwe storyteller he's got the poise to sell the gimmick yeah um, i think that's the thing it's taking it completely seriously um and even if it's a bit stupid which it clearly is i mm. think it's the just it's the doing it it's that commitment to the role that uh brings it across i mean that's the kind of that's what makes velveteen dream uh that's what made that work velveteen dream still slotted in for adam cole uh next week i believe yeah so um that i think will be the 
uh, they so they're still promoting that match, and I think the way that that match plays out will obviously be a, a big indicator of um, uh, where Velveteen Dream currently stands in WWE, considering everything. Uh, and then we've got our, our main event, of course, which is my favorite man. It's Limitless Keith Lee yeah. uh, doing doing a tiny bit of Amdram at the end of his match. No, because yeah. I am limitless. That was a I bit silly. No, I love it. I don't care. I, Keith, you can't say a bad word about Keith Lee because all of Keith, all of Keith Lee's matches have that theatric element to them. I think there's always that moment of uh, it's the popping up at the on the apron to yeah. Finn Balor. It's it's the you know those moments of superpower. I, and I think like Keith is one of those people that sells it because this is you know the no I am limitless, but this is his his larynx is fixed. We get the bit we get the promo earlier where he's like, my larynx is bruised. You may have done this damage to me, but I, I'm going to overcome. I'm limitless. Um, Priest had a really good promo package earlier, I thought, as well. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the guy's really good. Uh, actually, he makes it all seem off the cuff, and I think that's that's great. He's really settled into his uh, exact genetic mix of Roman Reigns and Baron Corbin role. <laughs> yeah. uh, Which I, is I what he's... WWE's always wanted. That's yeah. what the, they were hoping that putting them in all those matches together was going to spawn some offspring somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's uh, he's uh, he's got a really good voice. He reminds me a lot of Lo, uh, Loki mm -hmm. because he yeah just that very very uh, calm um, but very compelling uh, timbre to his voice. Yeah, I, I like he. I think he he took a little bit longer to catch fire than a lot of people. I think there was a bit of a Baron Corbin. Uh, element to him which put some people off mm. but this this main event has proved that yeah the guy can hang like this is a borderline takeover quality match uh with you know where he you know flying over the over the turnbuckle oh, to the outside God, yeah. uh like they they really left it all in the ring and i think that's why nxt is yeah nxt is working better in no fans than anything else because they just understand okay well Let's just put on a bloody great twenty-minute match every week, shall we? And let's just see see how long we can last. So uh, I mean, you've got... talking, yeah. And I think that's one of the things about Priest. I think that we we sort of getting to now is, and it took a long. I think what took a long time was I when I first saw it, I just went, "Oh, it's the vampires from Blade, the sexy mm -hmm. ones, all the ones that run clubs and stuff with the little rune logo on the outside." Um, and then you sort of, and then you're like, "Okay, well, or is he just like a rock star? I don't really know, or is he a stage magician?" Um, and then it, you sort of get to the point like the, the living in infamy thing I now sort of understand what the character is after and what he wants um, and I think him going up against Keith Lee here that makes sense storyline wise I love the sort of the cheap shotting I love the bringing back of the nightstick I think the finish was a bit goofy in places uh, mm -hmm. I think the bringing in the North American title to sort of distract the referee like it was literally a game <laughs> like it was that's how WWE games are programmed. If you pick up the chair and you walk over to the side and drop it, the referee's like, Oh, must put the chair away and goes over there <laughs> to do that. That felt like what happened, that felt like what was happening here, but it did lead to, a, I thought, a really cool ending. I thought the you know, the no, I am limitless line maybe clanged a little. Uh, but I really liked when he hits, he hits the big grizzly magnum and then takes the nightstick off him, and the ref goes like, Oh, oh and he goes up. Like, and just hands it off like yeah that, that was, was cool. really cool and then the, the double spirit bomb to finish this was i just thought this was great these guys have amazing chemistry um as proven by the match that they did with killian dane in as well um and the one with there was the one with die as well uh yeah I'd, I'd i'd love to see more of that i love the fact that nxt's uh mid card division is what raw's dream top division is yeah. like it's this is like Vince McMahon's wet dream it's like five big guys who can just fly I am c keeping my fingers crossed that the reason we're getting Gargano versus Dijakovic is that Gargano is going to go through him to try and get to Keith Lee that would be yeah. that would be my dream match at the moment for NXT can we talk uh, about yeah. one last thing for the match before we just we before we run out of time because I just want go for the, it. my favorite thing in this match is the gorilla press Oh, hang on. Press to the apron. This is just insane. Like, I get, look I at keep, that ref's face. Absolutely right. That's. I think. Yeah. That is. That is actual real emotion being shown there. That is just. I can't believe they did that. Um. I don't know how Keith Lee still just has things because he's had like 
I think since Survivor Series, um, he's had so much exposure on NXT after so much time in in the company, not really doing very much, and that being part of his character even before Survivor Series. And then suddenly, once they go on uh, USA, he has basically been a feature almost every week. And he's still pulling things out that make me just make my jaw drop. Mm. I, I still can't believe like and I still can't believe the things he can do. And yeah, yeah I, it just makes me hungry for the idea of him being a future NXT champion and then moving on to either Raw or SmackDown. And I think so. Like I think having matches with everyone. I think Gargano might like obviously this is my this is my complete dream for it. But yeah, if Gargano needs a title to sort of validate the heel turn, uh, give him something that he can just like parade around, like the mm-hmm. you know something that the king and queen both have, uh, then uh, Lee moving up to take the NXT title from Adam Cole. Just like the thing is, there's just so many matches. <laughs> you want to see? Give me a <laughs> uh, Yeah, uh, a, a really solid episode of NXT, buoyed by a fantastic. Uh, main event and yeah just some good some good character work i do think they're still they're missing uh, AA, aew i think pips the format just by having people in the crowd like i don't like if nxt i think it's difficult because their characters it, everything's so jumbled up that all their characters have real history with each other so it's going to be really difficult to have characters like in the crowd and not come to blows i get that but it feels like and it, that's the only thing that's missing from the NXT regular format. I feel like they've nailed mm. most of what it takes to kind of make this kind of program work, which uh, Raw and SmackDown still feels like they're struggling with. Yeah, and I think what I think what also this week's really cemented for me was that I feel like there was direction this week. I feel like we're now we've now got more things on the cards. We now sort of have a general gist of um, knowing either when we're going to get these title matches or. Um, knowing sort of when the stories are about to move on. And and f- I feel like we're sort of a bit more grounded. We, we, were so, we There was so long when TakeOver was just cancelled that it just felt like all the bets were off and nothing was really happening beyond we had Rhea and Charlotte was definitely happening. And we knew that Champa and Gargano were going to have their final match too. And then everything else was just up in the air. Um, mm-hmm. So I do feel like we've got a bit more of a firmer grasp of what's going forward. And that, that, makes the, that just makes the TV more compelling, I think. Like, I think it's something that Raw... Specific Raw is missing uh, drastically. It's just any kind of driving focus of just knowing who's going for what. Um, mm. It just seems like it's just a random rotating cast of ideally whoever Zelina Vega's partnered up with plus three other people <laughs> every week. Um, so it's nice to see that NXT is forging ahead with stories, even if, as the uh, lead story on this one suggests, they've had to can a few that were really exciting. And it'll be interesting to see how they navigate trying to put some of the things that they had in the cards back on the cards once we get out of this situation, because I'm sure they still want to do Balor versus Walter and plenty of the other matches that never really got to happen at TakeOver. Um, So it'd be really interesting to see. But I guess that is all we have time for for this edition of the NXT podcast. So please click the videos that have appeared on screen to watch more awesome WrestleTalk stuff. And there'll be a button somewhere to become a pledge hammer on Patreon where you can get uh, loads of extra content from us, which in these trying times you clearly want because everyone's got very little to do right about now. Anyway, I've been El Fagador Blake. That was Adam Blomp here and that was NXT.